welcome to podcast number two, Everything Manchester United. We've got Ryan here from In The Red. How are you doing, Ryan? Yeah, well, I was going to say, yeah, I'm doing really good, but it's, it's hard to say I'm doing really good after yesterday. So I'm It's a standard as... answer, like you've just been yeah, yeah. shot and you're like, I'm fine, I'm great. And it's like <laughs> a standard answer. It's like, actually, I'm not. United have just lost 5-0 to Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, as good as can it be feels, expected. Yeah, it feels, feels horrendous, doesn't it? Did you yeah. actually enjoy the game, any part of the game yesterday? And I enjoyed the final whistle. That, yeah, that, that yeah, that was yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, In fact, the only good, the only positive was actually the fact that we're, it's quite, it was quite easy to make your way out of the stadium because everyone had left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So losing five nil, it was like a nice walk. Normally, it's horrible. Yeah, it was easy. It, yeah, it was easy to get out, and you don't have to wait around too long. Yeah. People, to... people cleared the way for us at about 65 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's so about, about 35,000 uh, fans by the end. No, I've yeah, never seen was... anything like it. Like, there was um, some camera footage that came out. I'm assuming it was being filmed from Hotel Football. You know, with, um, Oh, the drone. The, yeah, like, like the, um, the like footage shot. of the front, the front of Old Trafford on Matt yeah. Busby Way. And there's just thousands of people leaving and it's, it's still light outside. So it... You know, the game didn't kick off till half four. It gets dark about half five, six o'clock. So that they must have been leaving on 60 minutes and uh, I'm, oh, oh, 50 minutes. As soon as that fifth goal went in just after half time, thousands of people leaving. I've never seen anything like that before. Not, no. not, even, not even under Van Gaal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone, yeah. Van Gaal. They often criticise Van Gaal. So, yeah. So are we thinking that Ollie's done? He's a goner. I think so, yeah. I think. I mean, I'm, I was saying I was speaking to someone last night about this. I've, I'll never call for Ollie to be sacked. Like, yeah, uh, definitely. Like someone, someone was saying, you know, what what does he need to do for you to be Ollie out? And it's I'm never going to be Ollie. I'm never I'm never going to call for Ollie to be sacked. He's too much of a legend. He's t- like, there's there's too much faith in the bank for me for what he did as a player and for what he's done as a manager as well. The things that people overlook. I'm never going to call for him to be sacked. But I think it has got to the point where I've sort of resigned myself to the idea that I think it's, I think it's, I think he's done. I think it's, I think it's finished. I do think so. Yeah. What about yourself? You think, well, I wouldn't sack him. I'd keep him for another 18 months and back him. I think that, I think that the problems as we've discussed a number of times are at an organizational level for United. Yeah. I don't, th- I, I think the narrative around football managers is a little bit misleading Football manager is a very important person in a football club, but they succeed or fail in line with the ambition and the organisation of a club. And if you look at, say, Guardiola as the obvious example, he's obviously an exceptional football manager, but he's very cleverly and very wisely with his advisors, chosen jobs, with organisations that have backed him fully and City are that on steroids. The whole of the club is designed to find elite players that play in his style of play and to give him what he wants. And as a result, his chances of success increase considerably. Since, Since the Glaziers have taken over, Sir Alex Ferguson was successful in spite of the Glaziers, not because of the Glaziers. And then since Sir Alex went, and actually Sir Alex went when when the class of 92 were, were retiring, he wasn't stupid. He understood what was happening. And since he's gone, all those managers have allegedly failed. And yeah, on the surface, they've failed, but they've been failed by the organisation and we've been failed as United fans by Glazier ownership because it's like, it's like this, right? Your expectations in life and your actions in life have to match each other. If United want to be the best team in England, they'd need to be probably the best club in Europe. And in order to do that, your actions in the transfer market and the infrastructure and the scouting and the director of football and all these things and and your data analyst team have to be in line with being an elite club. And they're not. So our expectations, me and your expectations are from a time when United were number one. But those expectations and the actions of the Glaziers contradict one another. So therein is, is the issue. 
I think that, um, Mark Ogden from ESPN wrote an article uh, today. Where he, he must have uh, he must have stole it off me then because that's. Uh... <laughs> well, I, I, well, I read his article think, this morning. I think he's agreeing. <laughs> he's agreeing with you on um, in the in the article. He definitely agrees with you on the Glazers, where he says that um, the mediocrity at Manchester United is it's above Solskjaer. It's you know mm. it, it, it's 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 because of the Glazers and the the type of the way that they run the club, etc. But I think in the, in the article he also <laughs> categorizes Solskjaer as a mediocre manager who is a part of that mediocrity that the Glazers have created. So yeah, he's, I didn't he's agree made, with that um, either. He says um, that the reason they're keeping Solskjaer in the job because it doesn't matter if a, if a manager is mediocre. And it's like what you were saying the other day about how if Solskjaer gets top four, then the Glazers will keep, it, will keep him in a job because they don't take a financial hit if United finish fourth, whereas they do take a financial hit if they finish fifth because they don't get the Champions League money. But, but that's the kind of mediocrity that um, the Glazers are fine with, are completely okay with. It's, it's, you know, it's the financial issues that they take issue, that they've got a problem with. But um, I don't know. I think, I also think that, the, especially Ed Woodward anyway, when you see, Ed, when you see Woodward's um, calls to invest to the investors, or when you, see, when you see his calls at board meetings and things like that, the thing he always talks about is online content and engagement that people have with, with, the, with the club online. And I think yeah. when... When the reason I I've sort of resigned myself to it being over is, um, it's to do with like the the appearance and the PR of it, especially online. Like I think I think the um the issue of of social managing United has become such a toxic issue now that I think since that loss yesterday, we're starting to see things in the media and in the press um that have met that are indications of 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 what it's gone past the point of a return now. I think like I was. I'll just show you some of these um, things that have been sh- like I've, I've just noticed in the press today um, that this morning um, Paul Hurst from the Times was showing that um, the uh, the players have started to lose faith in all these tactics. You know, a lot of the I mean, you saw the video of Ronaldo yesterday waving his hands all around when when one of the Liverpool goals went in, and people just assumed that that was. Um, you know, a criticism of all his tactics. But Paul Hurst is saying that, you know, some of the players have, you know, got criticisms of Ole. Um, they don't think that his coaching staff's up to scratch. Um, the Manchester Evening News as well um, did an article today where they were talking about um, certain players, like unnamed players, don't understand why Jesse Lingard isn't getting playing time when he, you know, when, when he has such an impact when he plays on the pitch. The issue of Donny van der Beek, apparently, you know, we were saying the other day, oh, Donny must be terrible in training. According to uh, Samuel Lookhurst, <clears throat> players are saying that he's at, apparently Donny van der Beek's really good in training. And it baffles them a little bit why he isn't playing. And then um, Jamie Jackson, who's the um, Manchester United correspondent for uh, The Guardian, um, he writes articles with Fabrizio Romano, who's you know the the real tier one trusted journalist when it when, yeah. when it comes to reporting what's going on behind the scenes at clubs. He uh, echoed a lot of the things that were already being reported. He said he, they, were, they were saying that players are questioning whether Solskjaer has the tactical now to take the club any further. Um, and I just think when when these kinds of stories come out, it's ominous, isn't it? To be especially honest. especially when it's such a similar story, and so many other journalists are reporting on the same thing. It's quite apparent that obviously the PR teams of the players have started briefing journalists straight away, you know, to, to sort of. Um, distance themselves from what's becoming quite a toxic uh, environment around around the manager so if the players are, are briefing journalists that they're they're also unhappy like the fans are unhappy i think that that type of situation um i think it's i think it's past the point of no return and also in the in the article that jamie jackson and romano wrote they mentioned about um how antonio conte is up for managing manchester united um around a similar time that uh, Luckhurst in the MEN was reporting the same thing. Conte is open to joining United. And then <clears throat> uh, this afternoon, um, John Luigi Longari from Sport Italia um, is reporting that uh, United is the first choice for, for Conte should, um, should United be interested in taking his services. And then fo- Luckhurst, following that at about three o'clock, is now reporting that United are considering sacking Oli. Um, and when Samuel Lucas tweeted this and put it out in the Manchester Evening News. Um, 
Romano and Jamie Jackson added an extra bit to their article on Twitter that Richard Arnold has cancelled all of his appointments for today to hold emergency meetings with Joel Glazer. So I think um, when 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 the media is reporting that to such an extent, yeah. and it it certainly looks like a brief from both from players from you know sources inside the club, and I think as much as um, we were saying yesterday, as much as there's mitigating circumstances um, for why the club's doing badly. And it's not all, you know, all these inept coach, like a lot of talk sport pundits would, would, would lead you to believe. I do think that there's, there's such an emphasis on how things look to, to, you know, to the outside that I think losing 5-0 at home to Liverpool in a period where there's such a toxic, you know, environment online around you anyway, I think it, I, I just think that you know the writing seems to be on the wall. I think, and um, as much so, as, as I was as I was saying before, as, mu- as much as <coughs> I'll never I'll never call for all his head. It does seem like uh, Laurie Whitwell, who's um, the Athletics Manchester United correspondent, also put a tweet out saying it feels like the end game now or the end times. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't see how um, you can pull back from this, um, or how Ollie can pull back from this, or how the the narrative surrounding him online can you've, you've uh, spoken to me a few times about the age of the spectacle and you, you've quoted a book a few times and I think it'd be interesting uh, just to speak about that for a brief amount of time I know it veers off into politics a little bit um, but I think it's interesting for because I think that that perception management is well and truly in number 10 Downing Street at the moment yeah especially. I think, well I think um not yeah, not 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 to go veering off into a big uh, political podcast. But, but yeah. the Glaziers come from that same school. Yeah, yeah, exa- of exactly. It, management of PR, don't they? Yeah, it's much. It it can sometimes be much more uh, efficient to manage how something appears than you know than than how it manage is. how it is the reality. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it's much easier to. Um, there's that uh, quote I, I mentioned in the other day. You know about um some. Mark Twain quote, I think, where he says, a lie can make itself around the world before the truth has managed to put its boots on. And yeah. um, I think sometimes, you know, it, if you can manage the narrative, you don't really need to fix the issue because the, the narrative is everything. You know, the way something is perceived is always all there is. You know, there's, there's, only, yeah. the, there's only the spectacle. So I think regardless of whether there's mitigating circumstances, regardless of whether, um, you know, uh, misrepresentations of the facts mm. exist, but regardless of all that, it doesn't really matter. Like so long as, so long as the, the majority of people believe a certain thing to be true, right. if it's more difficult to prove otherwise, then just move on. I think um, people will move on. And I think so that's- did 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 for example, the majority of people in the UK believe that Jeremy Corbyn was a terrorist sympathizer? Yeah, well, yeah, things like that, you know, and it's. It's, it's funny, really, because um, I, I noticed a thing today. You know, uh, Laura Koonsberg's resi- yeah, uh, she's resigned. Yeah, she's resigned as the BBC yeah. political correspondent. But someone showed this uh, interview she did of Jeremy Corbyn about two years ago, where she's as opposed to the one with uh, Boris Johnson. Yeah, but they're interviewing him in Brighton or somewhere somewhere <laughs> with a peer. I'm not sure where it was, but the the, the interview has really dull lighting, and it really like it, the, the quality of the video is quite bad. The backdrop behind Jeremy Corbyn has got this like dilapidated pier or something like that. And but the studio they were in was a was a temporary studio that they only used once just for that particular interview. So it painted Corbyn literally in a bad light. So when when people were thinking of you know the the well lit animated friendly banter interview that she did with Boris Johnson, and then they think of the dark dull uh, awkward conversation interview she did with Jeremy Corbyn. Even though, I mean, it might sound far fetched and conspiratorial to say that these type of things are intentional, but they are because um, subconscious as, as I, on a subconscious level. You... Yeah, ex- exactly. These 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 things are important, and there's a reason why. Um, you know, not to veer off into politics, but there's a reason why Dominic Cummings was so successful with the Conservative Party and the and the Brexit campaign is because he knows that and understands that. He even he even says it all the time. He, he always recommends this book, uh, Super Forecasters. And it's about managing uh, the public perceptions of the facts rather than the facts themselves. You don't need to tell people the truth. You just have to give people 
a version of the truth that um yeah you know, that, that appeals to them a little bit more yeah but and i think that's the thing with uh with football or with any with anything really anything that relies on pr management or um you know how th- how you are perceived especially online i think um there comes a point where it's too difficult to stand there trying to correct all the misrepresentations of the facts and sometimes it makes more sense to just you know have a clean break from it and start over again and i think that's what i think that's unfortunately what's happened i think people have come to the, come to realize that regardless of the mitigating circumstances of of ollie there's no way back now it's too toxic i think in my opinion anyway so okay let's assume that Solskjaer sacked in the next uh, 48 hours who replaces him and why uh well i think according to it looks like the briefs that are going out in the press to people close to the club it looks like antonio conte is the first is the first choice which you know i um i don't know i I don't think he's the right fit. I think he's just, he's quite short termist. He's he plays a he plays a tactical formation that United may have the players for, but it would it might it might sacrifice some of the more important players. He never plays with a ten, you know. Which, so it would be difficult yeah, for Bruno to fit 10, into that. <laughs> exactly. He doesn't play with wide wingers. You know, he plays with wing backs. United have United haven't got any wing backs. They've got a left back who's who's good at going forward, but isn't really a wing back. Tellez might be a okay wing back, but then you've got to sacrifice your best left back to play him. Aaron Wambasaka is a defensive full back, so mm. he'd probably play Dallo there, who is a you know hasn't proven that he's a isn't is good enough for Man United. I don't know. I think it would. I mean, it could be. I could be wrong. It could be amazing. Conte could come in and really you know stamp his authority on the club and everything. But it, I don't. It looks like he'd come in. We'd get to January, and he'd want to spend 150 million on four on four players for the team, and I don't think that's going to happen. The January after a summer where you've, you know, bought Varane and Sancho, and you're paying Ronaldo 400 and odd grand a week. I just don't think, I don't think he's the right fit. But you know, he looks like the more, he looks like the person that the club are going for. He looks like the easiest manager to recruit at this yeah. moment in time. You don't, don't have to get him out of a club pay compensation. Exactly, yeah, yeah. He'll probably come. He's won the Premier League. He has one where he's gone. Um, and so who would you get then? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, we were saying the other day that I think one of the thing, one of the reasons why Oli hasn't not well, not that one of the reasons why he hasn't already been sacked, but I think there would certainly be um more store up, there would certainly be evidence that the club was speaking to other managers already if there was an obvious choice to replace him. Like when, um, when Van Gaal won the FA Cup, um, it, they, they got Mourinho anyway, but that was because a manager of Mourinho's calibre was available. I think if Pochettino was still available, I think they'd, the news would be breaking today that Pochettino was, was, was going to be the United manager. I just think maybe the club are hesitant in hiring Conte Maybe they're hesitant in hiring someone like Zidane, or maybe Zidane doesn't even want to manage in the Premier League. I just, I think that I think they're not being a manager available complicates it a little bit. But as you said yesterday, it's Manchester United. They can go and take ninety nine percent of other clubs' managers if they if they wanted to. But then they've got then the Glazers have got to put their hands in the pocket for a compensation yeah. package. Because I feel like the modern manager has a discussion that's a lot different than, say, 20 years ago. They basically get assurances about transfer budget, about players, about power. And I think a lot of the top, top managers turn down jobs because if they don't get what they want, they don't take the job. And I think that one of the reasons why Klopp probably didn't come to United was he knew that he wouldn't have the power to actually do what he wanted to do, nor the time. And I actually feel, I've thought this for a long time, that in a way, the Glaziers were unhappy at how much power Sir Alex had. Because basically, he had more power than them. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to wrestle power and control from him. And I believe that one of the things they did, and you'd have to obviously go inside of Ferguson's mind to see whether this is an issue, is Riola 
and Pogba, Ferguson specifically had a problem with them and they brought Pogba back and dealt with Raiola. They then bought Mkhitaryan, who was a Raiola client. They also bought Zlatan, who was a Raiola client. And, and someone that, that Ferguson had publicly said, I wouldn't deal with, you know, at all, they dealt with. And I think that managers look at United, they look at the club and think, wow, but they also can tell the top, top, top managers wouldn't come to United. Guardiola, in my view, wouldn't take a job like United with the Glazier ownership because it's not just about money. It's about the infrastructure in place behind, uh, behind the club. Like, it's about, like, for example, right, why did we even hire Solskjaer? Right? It's not enough time to cleanse the squad. Right? If you're going to, yeah, um, if we'd bought, uh, two holder midfield players or a holder midfield player. If we bought Rice and I don't know, a De Jong or a Verratti or someone of top caliber and the whole team and squad was finished and for a season he failed, I'd probably say get rid of him. But you don't, you have a completely imbalanced squad. If you take the number 10 position as a non midfield position and as an attacking position, United have about 11, 12, 13 players to go into five positions. Not youth players, like 11 or 12 internationals. Martial's not even getting a sniff. Yet, you've got three players into two positions in the base of the diamond at six and eight. The squad's in balance. And United have needed a central midfielder who can pass the ball for actually many years. They had Herrera, he wasn't a ball player. They had Fellaini, he wasn't a ball player. Carrick was the last one and he retired ages ago. So your squad is fundamentally unbalanced. And yet people expect, like the owners expect United to be up there. Do United have a better squad than City, Chelsea or Liverpool? No way. They don't. They have some. They have some individual players that are better, but they don't have a better overall team. So United have got probably the fourth best team in the league. So, like the notion of oh, Ollie's doing badly. Like what did he, he overachieved finishing finishing second. Some of the teams dropped off, like Liverpool and United did. Like played like a pretty good season and were just fell away at the end because that's their level. But. Yeah. In terms of like Solskjaer being sacked, isn't it? It's a nonsense. Now, someone may come in, and a broken clock can be, you know, with what is tw is right twice a day. But someone can come in and potentially win a big trophy, but consistently succeeding at Manchester United is impossible with the Glaziers. So for me, I I don't see I don't see the need for the change. I really don't, but I, I completely agree with your perception management point. Yeah, I think I mean, even as even while we're talking now, um, uh, Chris Wheeler from the Daily Mail and um, James Ducker from the Telegraph have both put out the same thing, that players have lost faith in Solskjaer's tactical ability and that the club uh, are in touch with Antonio Conte's um, you know, agent and how was Ferguson so successful, right? The one reason, United weren't the highest spending club, right, over that period, especially when the Glaziers came. United were, like, spending net about 20 million quid. We sold Ronaldo for 80 million quid, and then they, were, I think, spent 19 million pounds. You got an old Obertan, Michael Owen on a free, and Valencia. I don't know if they were all in the same summer. And then you had United, you know, you had a core of players. But the reason why he was so successful is because he had power. And United should be very, very, very scared if Klopp or Guardiola both decide to stay at City and Liverpool for a long time, not because of the financial aspect, but 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 because when you've got that power, you're able to implement ideas. United's players can down tools, mm. right? And they'll continue under Fergie. You couldn't down tools. Basically, you were gone. Van Nistelrooy yeah. is probably one of the greatest goal scorers in the Premier League. Probably probably one of Man United's greatest goal scorers, right? Gone, done. He's over, finished. Yak Stam, arguably the greatest defender to play for United. Top three anyway. Mm. Won, the, won the Champions League. Unbelievable world-class defender. Done, you're gone. So if you wanted to get out of United, just have a just have an issue with, with Ferguson and you're done. So I the players that wanted to play there, 
and who were asked to move positions, to run harder, to work harder. They did that because they wanted to play for United and be successful. So power is important. And United uh, have got too much player power. Are you telling me, and this veers off topic a little bit, are you telling me that Ferguson would have tolerated Raiola? He didn't tolerate him. What the first time him and Raiola were like oil and water. Yeah, yeah, oil and water. Exactly. The famous cup. The first time that Pogba went on France duty and said anything, he would have been out. Yeah. Would have been finished. The first, you know, like so this notion, because uh, technically that means that players are running the running the club. And the players are self-interested. Not all of them are, like, but like Rashford's a United fan, Lingard's a United fan, but most of them aren't United fans. I think this and... is the thing. Uh, sorry, sorry to, to, to go. No, in. no, man, go think, for it. I think what you're saying is is um, is, is part of the issue that, that Ollie's got. I, I saw uh, Gary Neville and Graham Souness arguing on Sky Sports yesterday, and even even though Graham Souness talks, you know. Some nonsense sometimes, and he has m- huge agendas against most United. of the time. Actually, yeah, yeah. and he was, <clears throat> and he was more just you know, <clears throat> gloating about the, the the about Liverpool, you know, beating United. But um, he was ca- he was kind of also making a point against Gary Neville, which Gary ne- Gary Neville wasn't really um, dealing with the the, the point that Soonis was, was trying to make. What was the point exactly? Well, he was saying that Gary Neville was saying Graham Soonis was saying that. You cannot press with um, Ronaldo and your team up front because you can't just have you can't have a few players press. You need to always press as a team. You can't just have a few individuals press, which is correct. And Gary Neville was saying that you don't have to be a pressing team. You know, Conte isn't a pressing manager. Like you don't always have to be this high pressing, you know, energetic team to to win games. Like Tuchel, to, Thomas Tuchel isn't a massive high pressing manager either, and he won the Champions League last season. But the the point stands that um, United have had to change the way they play from last season by having to find a place for Ronaldo in the team. And I know that Ronaldo scores last-minute goals and he brings goals to your team. No doubt Ronaldo will score 20, 25 goals this season. But the way that when United's options didn't have Ronaldo in them, Oli would be able to go into a game against City or Liverpool or you know in the Chelsea in a few weeks and he'd be able to stick three at the back and he'd be able to play aggressive, an aggressive style of football and he'd have runners like Rashford, Dan James, Martial at the top to, to really um, like break whenever the team make a mistake always and, and get a goal out of it and win the game 2-1 or 1-0 or whatever. But when you've got Ronaldo in your team and you have you know, these kinds of players, you can't do that because Ronaldo's not going to press and he's not going to run around too much off the ball either. So Ole is now being forced to play in a way that he's not comfortable playing because he because he spent two years building a squad that can play the way that he envisages United should be playing. And he's now now he's got players in the team that he needs to find a place for, like Ronaldo. And because Solskjaer, uh, because uh, Pogba's in the last year of his contract, he's also got to find a place for him or he's going to leave for free. So Solskjaer has now got put... Why though? Like it comes back to the same point. No, no, this is what I'm saying. It, it is it is an issue of player power, but it's also an issue of the um, ineptitude of the United board for putting Solskjaer in this position. Anyway, he's hmm. now got. A, I don't think so. I mean, when Ronaldo is available, if you can get Ronaldo, you'll get Ronaldo. But if you've got, if you're still in this period where you're just putting the finishing touches to a team uh, that can then challenge, if if United played with. Cavani as a centre forward, for instance, and then they played with um, Sancho and Rashford and Bruno. That would be a much more balanced front line than Absolutely. the one than the one they're having to find now with Ronaldo. So, as much as Gary Neville was right, you don't have to be a pressing team. I think uh, Sunis is also right in that Ronaldo has made that attack disjointed, even though you know he gets what? the goal. Do you know what? I actually think that um, this is actually one of my criticisms of Solskjaer. I'm not, I wouldn't sack him, but I, I, I have got a criticism and that is you basically have three choices. You can be like a low block, you can be like a medium block, or you can press, but you can't do a hybrid of the two. You can't, a little bit of press, a little bit of low block because you get passed through. And actually, this, that Liverpool uh, demolition has been coming 
Like that's been coming. Leicester almost did it to us. He was almost playing at Le- the Leicester game a four-two-four. Yeah, yeah, four-two-four away from home. And in the um, in the Atalanta first half, he was doing the same thing, right? and you end up conceding. But luckily, <clears throat> as you were saying before the game, Atalanta are a really like open, aggressive team. They play yeah. quite similar to Leeds, so that's ideal for United to get back into a game. <laughs> but when you when you play a four-two-four, which it was at times, because Bruno is a second striker, the way he plays, he's like he almost plays as a centre forward all nearly the whole match. But I've never seen such well. It wasn't like this last season, and it wasn't like that the season before. But this season, it's like all of the criticisms that Ollie's had unfairly, in my opinion, about him being, you know, nowhere near it in terms of tactical ability in the past. You know, he's got no tactics. There are arguments that. You know, it's all vibes and moments and things on individual players. But this season, in the in the f- last three or four games, I don't know whether it's has <laughs> in, I don't know whether it's because Ronaldo's in the team or what he's trying to do, and or whether it's imbalanced or what. But I have never seen, and you see this more when you're at the game. I've never seen such gaps and space yeah, between, massive. between no the midfield and and the defense. Yeah. In the midfield and the attack. It's, it's oceans like, of space, and it? it's, like it's like four players yards and, a, of space. and a gulf. Then McFred, <laughs> and then a gulf, and then four fl- four players up front. Well, and- you know why that is, right? You know why that is because Maguire is a top, top, top defender. If you get Varane next to him, it'll help. But we don't have the pace at the back, so therefore the back line drops off ten yards. The forward line doesn't press, and then you've got this massive gap in the middle of the actual um, pitch. To be honest with you, with these players. I bet you Mourinho in a proper shit housery way would win because yeah. this squad is the best squad since Sir Alex. It's it's unbalanced, but it's about one or two midfielders away from being a top draw squad. However, I think that we'll we'll never know this, but this is what I'm gonna assume, and this is this is my assumption that United look at players like Pogba and they see them the same way that a property tycoon sees a building. They've paid 89 million for it. And this building that they paid 89 million quid for is going to be zero. They're going to leave them. So basically, Pogba is an asset that they want to sign up. And on a footballing basis, you can only really play Pogba or Bruno. If you're going to play 4-3-3 and play with width, you can't play Pogba on the left. Okay, you can drop him in here and there. And so, therefore, he's been shoehorned into the team. Who bought Ronaldo? Yeah, you had to buy him. He's got whatever, hundreds of millions of people on Instagram and all that. He's a glazier's wet dream, right? So they buy him. But football's a team game. Now, Ronaldo and Pogba are both world-class players. But if you don't play them in the right team structure with the right tactics and with the right runners, then you're in trouble. Look at Paris Saint-Germain's team now. They bought Wijnaldum, right? But who who do they have in midfield at the moment? And who will be in midfield all season? It's Adrissa Gay and it's Ander Herrera, two shithousery players because they've got three forwards who are not going to do anything. So Herrera, as we know, is a tactical genius. That guy is going to be a top manager. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take a bet on it. Now, he basically used to direct United, and the fact United let him go was a, was just a symptom of how crap the club is run. And then Adrissa Gay was top drawer at Everton. Yeah. He was one of the best holding midfield players in in the Premier League, and he's top class. And those two players are set up to give a foundation for Neymar and Messi and Mbappe to go and create. And as a result, even, even PSG may be in balance, but United don't have the players and or maybe uh, Ollie's under pressure to play certain players. And that comes back to my PowerPoint. A manager at the club, need, like if Guardiola... Right, can put Sergio Aguero, City's greatest ever player, on the bench for 18 months. That's, that shows who's in control. Mm. Raheem Sterling has just smashed it at the Euros. 
He wants to leave. Guardiola shrugs his shoulders and says, all right, then I'm not guaranteeing playing time to anyone. Mm. Right. When Klopp went to Liverpool, Mamadou Sako was their best defender. He turned up late. Klopp jettisoned him. Get out. And who've they got? They've got hungry players who work hard, who are, who, because if they don't, they're finished. They're yeah. done for. And it's not just the money. And you can say City have got all this money, but like City are a much better run club. And no player at City is bigger than Guardiola. Every single player is expendable because his power and his authority can't be challenged. And as a result, he can play six. He can play a false nine. He, you know, he can play... Uh, I, think, you know, I think that's also helped by the fact, though, that Pep Guardiola is bigger than City. No, like, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course he is. But, yeah, but uh, he is. But, like, Klopp's not bigger than Liverpool. The point no. is, is that is that the club either is 100% behind the manager or they're not. And players are not stupid. They know that. The players yeah. got Mourinho sacked. Right? Well, this is what this is what this is why I'm this is why I'm thinking that it's it's now got too. Yeah, toxic. you're right, man. I agree because, with you completely. Because the players are well, the players PR teams and the players representatives, etc., are, are briefing well, like, football, I hate football that, journal. I, I I hate that shit. It's yeah. awful. Because, right, what it means is that the next manager comes in. You don't like his face, you're down tools. The form that United had in that January after Mourinho went and Oli came showed you the level of the players. They were in championship form. They just didn't do it for the whole season. They they're in championship form for six months. This so is, what does that tell you? Like but this is true. another thing that I think um, is a. I think I think there are there are fair criticisms of. I mean, you can't you can't be in the patch that United are in now. And not have the manager, ha- you know, be responsible for large parts of it. And I think, as much as as we were saying before, as much as there are mitigating circumstances for the for the issues that Ollie's faced at United, I also think that there's some fair criticisms that you could that you could like we were saying the other day about. Um, I don't think he's tactically uh, flexible enough. I think can he tries I, can to. I, can I can I interrupt? Apologies for my rudeness and ask you one question. Right, finished second last season. The implication yeah. that he's not good enough means no, I, I'm not... that someone can come with those players and finish above second. And I the think someone will that... come. With, I think someone will come and buy a defensive midfielder and challenge for the league, though. Because I think I'm not thing, sure. I think the problem that Ollie faces that a, a new manager won't face is the is the toxicity that already surrounds it. I think you know when they talk about a new manager bounce. I also yeah. think that I also think the players are affected by the negativity around the club as well. I think... But, like, they're know, creating the negativity. Yeah, of course because, they are, Because think... by, like, by being egotistical and coming out. Also, like, United's running stats, right? Yeah, Let's shit. talk about United's running stats. That's not on Solskjaer. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's They're true. lazy, right? They're lazy, privilege, and they, they don't want to take responsibility. <clears throat> and, think... and, like, and, and, like, for me, right, okay, sack Solskjaer get rid of him but until you have a manager or a director of football or or some type of uh, bureaucracy in place that's bigger than the players you're you're done for you're finished because when like for example let's say uh, in your job or my job we don't like the manager and we know that if we if our productivity goes down for six weeks we can get him sacked and we get someone else that we like him we do it if you you know we've all worked in jobs with people who we hate if we if we had that power but but we don't and these players have got too much power yeah without a doubt but i think um the one thing that ferguson i know you shouldn't really compare anyone to ferguson cuz oh it's, you know, he was like a genius important. but i think the one thing that ferguson was able to do <clears throat> and i think other, some other managers are able to do it um that the thing with solskjaer is when he had the interim period when he went on I think it was like 10 wins in 12 games and yeah. two draws when he, when he first came. That was like the, the best, the most successful start 
to any new Premier League manager in the history of the Premier League. Like no, no new manager had ever had such a great start than Solskjaer. So everyone says, you know, he got the job because he won in Paris. Like, that's n- it's nonsense. Yeah, he got exactly. the job full time because he won 10 out of 12 matches um, on, when, when he first started. You can't, you can't really say to someone, you know, when they go on that run that they don't deserve a deal. And they maybe should have stayed till the end of the se- or, you know, waited till the end of the season to figure it out. But, you know, when someone wins 10 out of 12 of their first games, you know, that's why he got the contract, not just because of Paris. But um, one thing that I, I would say can, you know, it could be a fair criticism is when, when he went on that big run and then United players got tired and a lot of them got injured. And they got, well, I remember that game against Liverpool when United got three injuries in the first half, like yeah, Jesse Lingard yeah. and a few others. I think when those players that were part of that quite rigid system that he was playing got injured, it, the form fell off a cliff. I think last season, um, United finished second, but they almost didn't because when Harry Maguire got injured at the end of the season, the form fell off a cliff and they lost in the Europa League final. And I think this season, because he's having to shoehorn Pogba or because of his contract or Ronaldo because it's Ronaldo and all these into, into his team, the form's falling off a cliff again. And I think that is, is part of the same criticism of him lacking tactical flexibility. He has this specific way that he wants United to play. And when he has the personnel to do it, United can batter anyone. They can blast teams away. Like, but when but he like, doesn't, that's not on him, though, is it? No, that's, it's not on him. But I just think another that's manager. On the club's budget, because right, you're like, Ferg- Ferguson was able to switch up the way that he played. Like, you see games where Ferguson plays Park G Sung as like a defensive midfielder, or he'll play. There was a game when he was playing um, Raphael as a as a central midfielder or a defensive question, midfielder. Question and for one, you, man. Question, question for you. Let's assume Ferguson's 15, 20 years younger and he's managing United now with City uh, in the Premier League. Do you think he wins the league? I don't know. Who knows? But we've said this We've said this before. The, the, the top three in the Premier League are probably, you know, three of the top four teams in Europe. So Solskjaer's not only facing a an improved top four. Yeah, exactly. He's facing the three of the best teams in Europe. One of them's a Champions League winner. One, the, other, the other one's a Champions League finalist. And the other one won the Champions League the season before. Yeah, so, exactly. you know, these... And was in the final the year before that. So, like, statistically, City, Chelsea and, and Liverpool are probably the three best teams in Europe or the four best teams along with Bayern. So, yeah. that's that's the, the competition in the Premier League now. It's not like, you know... Before, when uh, he'd be facing, uh, you know, whoever's the runner-up in the Ferguson, would be facing Ancelotti's Chelsea, who, you know, who were good, but not, um, you know, they weren't, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like they weren't yeah. at the level. They weren't at the level they're at now. Like it'd, it'd be the equivalent of Fergie being in the Premier League at a time when um, Pep's Barca and Zidane's Real Madrid but were also in the. Premier everything's League. comparable though. So like some of the circumstances have changed. Number one clubs in mid table are richer so for you to go and pick up their players which united united haven't really had much luck with foreign players obviously Cantona famously but like like united really um, you know over those decades of success did very well by picking up british players the best irish players the best england players and they're able to go to clubs even like tottenham like City, with the, the some of the richest owners in the world, couldn't get Harry Kane out of Tottenham. 25 mm. years ago, you know... Well, yeah, 15, 15, 20 years ago, Fergie would have been able to go get Grealish, go get Rice, you know, go get exactly. whoever. Like, but now, you want Grealish, it's 100 million. You want Rice, yeah. it's 90 million. Like, so, and yeah, those, te- those teams, the Aston Villas and the, and the West Hams... Yeah don't need the money anymore yeah, so it's like you want, you want our best player break the record to get him like, yeah so. you need to break the record and you saw it with um, Juan Pasaka so I'm not obviously I'm not saying Fergie's not a genius but what I'm saying is that like a lot of the criticisms of Solskjaer are in a context where the landscape has changed it's like it's like saying that Derek Chisora is a rubbish boxer but there's probably only five people in the world that could knock him out out of seven billion people so statistically He's number four out of seven billion. So he's not a rubbish boxer, but he's not going to be the champion. You know, yeah. he's not going to be... Well, so it's the same thing. You can say Solskjaer's rubbish. He finished second or whatever, or he might finish fifth. But like, you, you're up against a state and mm. you're you're in a world where for you to assemble a team previously, 
was much, much easier. And your hamstrung, because also like what, what qualifies the glaziers to sack Solskjaer? What, what footballing knowledge does Ed Woodward, uh, Richard Arnold and Joel Glazier have? What, what's their, their perception of football is like you and me running a rugby team. I don't know anything about rugby, but I know who Martin of Fire is. Right? Joan Alomu. <laughs> yeah, Joan Alomu. Exactly. They're like they're probably like 50 years of age. I have no idea. I think that's Joan Alomu's died, hasn't he? Has he? Oh, rest in peace. Oh, yeah. Actually, he was a beast, wasn't he? But like the sort of what qualifies these people. And this is part of the issue because United, forget the debt, right? Forget Glazier ownership. If United even under the Glaziers, had a strategy, then they wouldn't be sacking Oli now, which we agree is probably coming inevitably. They would, they would determine a direction, look at the squad. And like, for example, uh, two weeks ago, it said the board expects United to challenge for the Premier League. I don't. I don't, mm. I, I like, please, if someone can explain to me why they think that team can challenge for the premiership, I'll expose them for knowing nothing about football because that team, 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 team is dysfunctional. And it has been because it can't move the ball from the third, first third to the final third because the midfielders, as much as they try, aren't designed to do that, mm. right? So you need to go into the transfer market or get lucky in your youth system and get a number six and a number eight that can pass the fucking ball because Fred and McTominay can't penetrate or you need to also like United play against low blocks consistently. We don't have an attacking right back. You need to go into the transfer market and buy a right back who you can rotate with Wan-Bissaka to fix that issue. Are you telling right? I, I, like I come back to, sorry, man. I come back to this same example. Guardiola came to City, finished fifth. And they released four fullbacks. They didn't sell them. They released them and they bought three world-class fullbacks and paid 140 million quid because, like, the director of football mm. um, from Barcelona that was there, they looked and said, right, this is, a ta- this is an issue. So they went from fifth to first. So that took them up, a right back and a left back and a, and a versatile right and left back. Because, so United, it doesn't require a director of football. If you were to put in that team uh, a top draw defensive midfield player and a number eight that can pass the ball, you would be challenging, right? I think that was the plan, though. I think the, the, the plan going into this summer was to get yeah, but- Sancho and Varane, show up the defence and get, finally get a right winger, but then try and get Trippier but they thought they were going to get him for a cheap for on a cheap for 10 million or something. And then Atletico were like, no, you can have him for 25 million or whatever they said. Yeah, ludicrous. And I also obviously. think a defensive midfielder was on was was on the agenda. But then I think as soon as um Woodward and the Glazers bought um Ronaldo, because they're not football people, they were like, You've got Ronaldo now. That's it. You win the league. You've got Ronaldo in your team. Oh. Like, in the same way that PSG have got Messi, they're the best team in the world. But it, it it's pinpoints the problem with them, with what you're saying before. Like, we know nothing about rugby, but we know who Joan Alomu is or whatever. Yeah. But I remember that in that footage of Ed Woodward when United signed Bastian Schweinsteiger, when he's he says to the person who's speaking to him, he goes, when you see Bastian Schweinsteiger on the team sheet before the game, that strikes fear into a, an opponent. But Schweinsteiger was well past it by the time he, he came was to like United. injured, wasn't he? he was like... Yeah, he was past it. He was done. Like Bayern Munich don't sell players when they're not done. Like they, Bayern Munich a, saw United coming and were like, ah, okay. You don't get a player from Bayern Munich if he's still in form. Like it's, they don't sell him. Like you will. That's why uh, Van Gaal couldn't get Muller for. I think he, yeah. they were bidding all sorts of prices for him. Just, money, didn't they? Yeah. Just never, never going to let him leave. Just they just like, don't need to sell their players, do they? No, they, they, and they won't sell them because they also don't need the money because they've got a monopoly on the Bundesliga. Like, in, like the equivalent of what Bayern can do is like us going to Liverpool and just taking Salah and yeah. taking taking Bayern, Allison and like yeah. the, the way that they could, there's, there's only one team that can ever really catch them in Germany and that's Dortmund. Like, and then the they only one that's decimate up there. them every they two or three years. The yeah, time, they just yeah. go and take. Yeah, yeah, it's so, madness. So. It's a di- this, this is why I don't 
Like some manager might come and get lucky, but the club under Glazier ownership, United will never do anything. Ferguson masked over it with with his with with the class of '92. And, and listen, all the things I've said about Fergie doesn't. I'm not in any way suggesting that Sir Alex isn't the greatest manager of all time. What I'm yeah, saying is that the the club enables you to win. It's not like so. This fixation on managers. It's almost like in politics, like the fixation upon leaders. It's like there's a whole civil service behind the person. There's a whole economic trend that's happening. There's a whole infrastructure that you haven't or haven't built. You know, there's like. 150 years of activity that have happened before you. It's like, oh, you know, such and such is the problem. Like, it's it's systematic. It's why the experience of Brendan Rodgers at United would be a very different experience than he has at, Le- at Leicester. Like, at yeah, Leicester, I don't think he'll take the job. Yeah, at, at Leicester, there's a whole, uh, you know, he has this huge safety net underneath him where he's got football people speaking to players. He's got you know, budget. Are that, Leicester, are Leicester better than United in the transfer market? Yeah. Undoubtedly. Easily. Yeah, yeah. Look at uh, like look at look at Dhaka they've just bought. Um and look at um uh, Bubakar Samare and look at Fafana. I think the right. I mean the, the argument that you know there is the argument that it's different for Leicester than it is for United. United need hits with players all the time. So United don't really have the ability to invest in players who might not be a hit. You know, that, whereas Leicester comes by someone like Samare, slowly bring him into the team. Like, look what's gone on with Van, Van der Beek. If you try and slowly bring someone into the team, you get slated and you've, you've, the press are constantly talking about how it's a flop. Where I think at Leicester, you can buy five players, leave two of them in the reserves for six months and no one really cares. You can't really do that at United. So there has this, like, there, there is this safety net, but also sure. at the same time, there's a massive level of support for the manager there in terms of, you know, if you're winning behind the scenes and United just don't have that. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're winning, Van der Beek isn't an issue. It's just something to yeah. slag you off. So, right, hypothecate. Let's say you picked up Declan Rice this summer and paid an exorbitant amount of money for him and you picked up another, you know, like uh, like someone else, like, like, a, like a ball playing six or an eight. United would be near the top of the league. And... The reason why they don't go for Rice is because it's all about spending net 40, 50 million pounds, right? This notion that the Glaziers have spent a lot of money, they have, they have spent 1.4 billion pounds on transfers in 16 years, right? They have sold about 400 million pounds worth of players. So they've basically net spent a billion pounds in 16 years. Right. And they've also, uh, you know, that doesn't take into account like, you know, loan fees and the value of the players that we have now. City have spent a billion pounds since Guardiola has been there. Chelsea have spent 450 million quid in the last 18 to 24 months. Everton have spent 500 million pounds in the last three, three and a half, four years. Mm. So, the notion that, like, the glaze in isolation, yeah, paying 80 million quid for Maguire is a lot of money. But if you want to compete with these teams, then you're going to have to get 22 top players. And in terms of, I still maintain, right, that even with the Glazers in charge, if they were to cede power, because it's all about power, cede power to a proper director of football, like, like a Campos, they would buy the right players because. You know what, right? Football teams are a jigsaw. They're a jigsaw that you put together and you can buy a player like who fits and and who doesn't. If I said to you, when Brendan Rodgers was sacked at Liverpool, who's going to be considered world-class? Firmino or Divock Origi? Right, who's going to be seen as being like one of the best number nines in the world? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have said Firmino, but Firmino just fits into that style of play. So yeah. that was a little bit lucky that it was there. So the question of style 
And the question of player recruitment has to all be pointing towards the same way. And we've still got players from the Van Gaal era, the Moyes era, that, that Ollie's still clearing out. And this, this just comes to another criticism of how the club is ran. Because yeah. actually, the point you made about Ronaldo is basically correct. Like, how did, like, who, who sat down and said, right, this season we're going to press or we're going to be a low block or we're going to do this. Who sat down with Solskjaer and who sat down with Ronaldo and said, this is how we're going to play. You're going to have to run 12, 15 kilometers a game. Nobody did. Mm. They saw the dollar signs. They saw the social media. They saw, as you touched on at the start of the podcast, the perception management of Ronaldo. I and it's never going to work at United. Even more so with that, I think with Ronaldo, because he was in talks with City, I think there comes back to this PR management of the Glazers couldn't let United's arguably greatest ever player join City. I think yeah. this, this perception that there's a power shift from, from United to City would have gone into overdrive if City were able to go and... It's already United happened, though. Yeah, it's, yeah, already, that, it's not but, because City put a post up. It's already happened. No, like, no, but if, if City were able to go and get Ronaldo, if City won the league this year... Imagine like the amount of chances City create. Imagine how many goals Ronaldo would get at City. So if City were able to win the Champions League this year with Ronaldo, imagine if City's first ever Champions League was won by Ronaldo. Like the type of PR that is that the type of negative PR and rewriting of history that 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 would cause for Manchester United would be, you know, it'd be shocking. And I think that played a huge part in why they went and got Ronaldo. It wasn't so much as Ronaldo was available. Let's go and get him. I think it was more a case of Ronaldo's in talks with City. We cannot let that happen. So yeah. I think that had, a lot, that had a lot more to do with it as the well. The thing is, Ronaldo's not the problem, right? Ronaldo's no, no, not no, the no, issue. Not. If you'd have bought Rice and bought De Jong or bought Verratti off or bought, like, even if you saw something in, like, like a long staff or someone like that, I don't know. I don't scout players enough. But if you, if you improve that midfield, Ronaldo's not the issue. The point is, and we agree on this point, that there's just there isn't joined up thinking. Mm. This is a jigsaw. You piece it together, and sometimes you got you go and buy a Park Ji Sung. Sometimes you have a James Milner. Sometimes you have a Darren Fletcher. Yeah, you know some. So like the jigsaw gets put together, and there's no jigsaw at United, and then like they like they are they are the common denominator. David Moyes isn't a bad manager. He's yeah. not a bad manager. He was there for seven months. Did he fail? No. You cannot fail in seven months. Van Gaal spent two years, won the FA Cup, and he and he was starting to establish a style of play. And they didn't give him the players he wanted. He didn't fail. It's the club that fails. The club is going to continue to fail. So, yeah, I think Oli's going to go. and But it's not going to change... Conte may come, they might win the league, one off, this or that, but the dominance of those clubs isn't just financial, you know. Mm. It's not true. Like, the Saudis can go to Newcastle and make a mess of it, you know, I'm telling you. And City, and I hate complimenting City because their owners are human rights abusers and, you know, undemocratic. But park that to one side, forget that they're the owners and forget that City spend a lot of money they really have put a structure in place to increase the odds of being successful. Guardiola is going to leave in 18 months. If I was a gambling man, I'd, I assure you that City in the next decade are probably going to be the most successful team because the organisation is set up in such a way to be successful. And United are not. United, United buy third and fourth choice players on their list. And who's come up with that list? Like, you hear it. Oh, uh, Richard Arnold's blocked to transfer. What qualifies? Or oh, Joel Glazier's intervened. Like, what qualification has Joel Glazier got to actually intervene in a transfer? He doesn't. There isn't. The manager doesn't have power, and they've not gone and, gone and got a Lewis Campos and said, Lewis Campos, go and find us the best in class players, and we're going to play this style for the next 15 years and he'll go okay then here's the best in class here's the friend here's the here's, here's the new Pogba 
Here's the new Mbappe. Here's the new Bernardo Silva. But they won't do it because they, they see a Varane and they go, ah, World Cup winner, Champions League winner, ah. And they see, they see a Ronaldo and they see a Pogba. Well, let's re-sign Pogba. He's, he's, a, he's a fashion icon. He's just designed a pair of fucking vegan boots with Stella McCartney. He's a, and he's bollocks. I don't care. Conte's not going to do shit. We're going to mm. be in this perpetual situation. And it's not just the debt. It's not just financial. These people, they're going to buy a cricket club. They've got... A, they've got oh, yeah, I saw that the, today. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Like, yeah. One of the reasons why this morning um, someone was reporting <clears throat> that the Glazers were in talks with um, Richard Arnold over at Ollie and some... Um, I can't remember which journalist it was. It was quite a well-known journalist commented saying, the Glazers aren't in talks about Ollie at all. That At this moment in time, they're putting in a bid to buy a cricket a cricket club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, is that is that a baseball team? It's like, no, it's cricket. It's a different thing. But like, and so yeah, I agree. Ollie's gone. He's not. It's ninety nine percent. He's gone. If he's not gone now, he's gone. This is this is al ala war in Iraq, isn't it? Like just starting to brief journalists about. I think that's what it is. Yeah, I think more and more will come out. I think by by this evening, I think. Most um, journalists that work with United, you know, from the Athletic and the Guardian, and all, all the United correspondents for these publications, have all come out today saying the same shit all around a similar time, which makes it obvious that it's a brief. Thing is, Ryan. Thing is, Ryan. Like, like it like makes me hate the players. It makes mm. me actually hate them because I think like you shit, don't sack him and sack them. It's like it's like every time there's these little briefings and they've got little PR teams like. Piss off. I think that's the th- that's that's the thing. They get um, they they're trying to. Di- I mean, even bringing up when the the MEN saying that players are baffled by why Oli doesn't play Van der Beek, even though Van der Beek's great in enough. training. Like, but like, even that itself is an indication that the players are now doing damage limitations and briefing shit that they know is a buzz issue for the fans. Like, oh, we we don't understand why he doesn't play Van der Beek either. Oh, uh, we don't understand why he's not playing Jesse either. We don't like, and it's just what, what else do the fans have issues with Ollie with? Let's just put out some stories that we also believe that. So I don't know, man. I think I do think he's gone. I don't like um, Fabrizio Romano posted before that um, United are hesitant to take Conte because they think he's too similar to Mourinho. So maybe it won't be Conte. I'm not sure. He probably isn't too similar to Mourinho. I think you know what, right? I'll say this, right? Mourinho, in many ways, annoyed me. Criticising the youth players, his general dour demeanour. But another part of me completely agrees with him. Another part of me completely understood that, like, he was, he was saying that United's expectations and United's actions don't, ma- don't match up. If you want to, like, we finished second, we were, like, 19 points behind City, I think. Like, if you want to push on to another level, you need to, go and, you need to go and push out in the transfer market and buy better players. And that's basically why he left. He basically got himself sacked by being such a, such, such a wanker that they had to sack him. And he walked away with 30 million quid. Because, that's what Conte did at Chelsea. Yeah, no, but... He- but, con- but the difference with Chelsea is the difference with Chelsea is, is that in the past 10 years, they've had success because they buy elite players. Mm. Are you telling me, are you telling me that um, Chelsea blood Greenwood? No. Greenwood, Greenwood's out on loan for two or three seasons. Then they're either selling for massive money or they are bringing back any players, right? Chelsea buy ready-made players. Straight away, ready-made players. There's no doubt about it. Are you telling me that uh, that, uh, Chelsea blood McTominay? No way. He's out on loan for three or four seasons and they either bring him back if they need to fill the squad. And whilst he's out on loan, they've bought a World Cup winner or they've bought a top player. And United have a sprinkling of them. Chelsea have got a better better squad than United. There's no doubt about it. Mm. And look, they bought Werner for... Pretty decent money. He failed, or he's failed. They bought Lukaku for huge money. If he yeah. fails, they'll buy someone else. So, and like to not bore you, like I'll use example with City. 
Joe Hart was England's number one. Top class keeper at that point. He'd won the league with City. Guardiola came, two or three training sessions. I need my goalkeeper to play out from the back. Sorry. Yeah. Drops him. England number one. Buys Claudio Bravo. Finishes fifth. Bravo drops a number of clangers. Sorry, it's not working. Goes and gets Edison. If Edison had failed, he would have bought someone else. He would have carried on until they got it right. And that's the difference with United and with City. Those, those are the levels. Those are the levels. So yep. there you go. Depressing shit, man. <laughs> I'm well upset, actually. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you... It's just Liverpool, though, isn't it? Losing 5-0 to Liverpool. It's horrible. You run out of things to say, <laughs> eventually. Yeah, we do. So, shall we wrap it up there, man? Yeah, yeah. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for... It's, just, it, it's, one, of those, um, it's one of those chats where... Because I'm trying to, because we're, we're chatting about it, and I'm trying to keep an eye on news because I'm just expecting the news <laughs> to break at any, any any moment. So, Ollie's yeah, been sacked live on one eye on the chat, one eye on the chat, and the other yeah, eye yeah. on the um on <laughs> trending news. So, yeah. All right, cool. I don't man. know, man. I think I, th- I do think the writing's on the wall. I mean, it is one. Of, it's like like I say, I'm not I'm I'm not going to join some camp. I'm also not going to disrespect such a club legend either. And I think a lot a lot of the criticism of Ollie and pictures of him as a clown and all the sorts of shit that coming from so-called United fans is disgusting. But I do think, you know, there's, there's two ways of, one way of looking at it is, you know, he deserves the respect and I'm never going to, you know, join the choruses of calling for him to be sacked. But on the other side, I think if you, if you look at it objectively, the situation, I think all of the indications are that that's, that's where we're heading. I mean, even if it doesn't happen this week, I think, the the doubt is 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 in the minds of the owners. This you know the seeds have been sown by the players that they're, they're losing faith in him. And I think once that happens, especially when you've got a player like Ronaldo in your team, Ronaldo didn't come to United to to finish fourth. He came to United to win trophies. He's, you know it's, it's Ronaldo. If United doesn't win the Golden Boot this season, he finished United, fourth for Juve last season. So no, but he won the Golden Boot as a yeah, I suppose yeah. You know he won a cup though, didn't he? He won a cup uh, with, with Juve last season. Yeah, I think so. I don't think he was trophyless. I might, I might be wrong. Maybe, maybe they were. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's grim, grim times. It feels, it feels worse than it did when Mourinho went because it's Solskjaer. So, but you see, uh, I don't know what to say. We'll see. That... No, no doubt, we'll have another podcast when. Yeah. When it inevit- when, when the axe inevitably is is swung. So. When the axe has fallen. Yeah. 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 All right, man. We'll wrap it up there. Cheers for joining the channel. Please subscribe to In The Red. Um, please subscribe to Shaftman TV. Thanks for joining us if you've lasted uh, probably an hour and 20 <laughs> minutes right to the end. Uh, if you can like and share the video, yeah, we, it helps. We us. went on a bit. Yeah, we Sorry. went on a bit. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. It was it's basically therapy. It's not even like a, it's yeah, not even yeah. a football podcast. It's just therapy. Yeah, it was, there was. Um, I was watching someone doing a podcast yesterday, and they were talking about after the Liverpool game, and, and someone, someone commented into their channel and was like, "Really happy that you're doing this, guys. You know, can't can't be in it on my own at the moment. I'm glad we're all dealing with it together." And it was like this: po- the podcast they were putting out as, as a response to Liverpool game ended up being like a group therapy session for a lot of, <laughs> for a lot of United fans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Oh, well. Cool. Ah. Have a top day. Thanks a lot for joining us and we appreciate your time. Please like and share the video to help us uh, get boosted on the YouTube algorithm, an algorithm that we're all at the behest of. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.